Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Stan, an alcoholic, <laughs> with a coal, and uh, I'm going to do the best I can. I got some water up here, so that'll probably help. And welcome to all the new people, and happy birthday to everybody that's got a birthday. Some a lot of sobriety in the room, and I remember I was at the first meeting of this group, and it was it was a little talk that I did on a Friday night in front of like four people. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it's like, this is like way different, right? Um, and you guys are having a good time, and it's Happy New Year to everybody. You know, it's a brand new year, for whatever that means. I mean, to me, I do this thing one day at a time, so it's like, you know, all right, what day is it? You know, that's how I do it. So uh, I don't make goals or try to do those, what do they call them, revolutions, resolutions, what do they call them things? Yeah, I don't do those, you know, I just... You know, one day at a time is good enough for me. So, for the new guy, and all those that are new, please keep coming back. I'm going to tell you that uh, there's a lot of things that happened in, in this last year. I, I'm probably not going to go into all of that, but, um, you know, a lot of people didn't make it to the first. You know, be it whether they stayed sober or they went out or they never found us. So, to just be standing here or sitting in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, having a place to go with people who are as nuts as I am, that's a good thing, you know. Because, I mean, I don't know, I mean, about you, but the things that I used to do before I found Alcoholics Anonymous were not come and be polite and courteous and hang out and, you know, and look like this. You know, I didn't do that kind of stuff, right? I'm from Fresno. I mean, by uh, I'm actually now I live in Sacramento, way of Fresno. That's where I grew up. Yeah. And if you've ever been down there, I mean, Fresno is growing. Um, you know, give it some props, okay? It's bigger than Sacramento, okay? They just don't have anything to do down there. Everybody goes to bed at 10, you know. So I moved out, you know. I might get to that a little later too, but um. You know, this is a, it's been a, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to just even open my, my mouth and to say anything for the program that has saved my life. You know, my sobriety day is July 10th, 1988. And what I got to say about that is that, you know, May of 1988 is when I really started trying to get sober. Up to that point, I didn't know anything about you guys, didn't care about you, didn't want to be around you. Okay. Um, but in May of 1988, what I did was I went into this place, and what they did was they introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And from when I came out of that place, it, from June to July, it's for the new people. I'm going to talk to them tonight. All the rest of those, the people who've got time, my sponsor always tells me, the sickest guy in the room is the guy behind the podium, number one. <laughs> and number two, everybody that's got more time than you ain't listening anyway. So I'm not talking to y'all, okay? I'm talking to, the, talking to the new people, all right? So anyway, you know, I came uh, from June of 1988 to July of 1988. My story is this. I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I would keep, I would go out. I come in and go, I'm staying, I got one day, I can barely raise my arm, I'm starting to work out again and my joints are hurting. But I'd say, I'm staying, I got one day, I'm staying, I got one day. And it was on and on and on for 30 days. You know, my home group is group three, that's where I came in at. And, um, you know, I'll say that group three is like 55 years old and by the time you guys get there, I'll be dead. So, well, I don't know why I just wanted to say that, but, uh, you know. Oh, it is, huh? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I would come in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I would do was I'd keep coming in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay? There's people that they would come and then they wouldn't come back. What I did, as frustrated as I was because I couldn't attain any amount of time, length of time, was I'd come back. And I'd just sit in the meetings and I'd say, is there anybody new? Yeah, me. I, you know, and I just would do that. July 10th, actually July 9th of 1988, what I was doing was I was sitting in group three, and 
I, was, I, uh, I don't know how much time I had at the time. And I was sitting in the back where all the new people sit. In the back. <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> you know? So I was sitting in the back. And all I did from the time the meeting started at 8 o'clock was look at the clock and count the minutes. Because in my mind, one more time, it's like, well, after this meeting, I'm going to go out to this club, and I'm just going to sit out and watch people, and I'm going to have, have a tonic, and everything is going to be fine. And if you're new, I understand, because I thought that it was going to really be fine. I waited for the meeting to end. And at 9.30, man, I was out the door. I mean, I said the Lord's Prayer, you know, boom. You know, I was gone. Went to the club. Set out in the club. And I ended up sitting at this table where there's a couple guys who, uh, who drank with me before. And they sat down next to me and they said to me, they said, hey, man, we haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? And I said, you know, I'm getting sober, man. I pulled out my little coin and I showed them my coin, you know, and... All they cared about was the waitress coming over, taking their order. <laughs> oh, oh, Bill's coming here. Oh, man. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so I sit there, you know, and I'm drinking this tonic. And what I did, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, this tonic's not giving me anything. So let's say I tried it with the cherry. Bring me one with the lime. Then I got one with the lemon. Then I got, you know, I kept on going like this. And finally, I was looking at these guys' drink. And they seemed to be having a good time. They really did. They were talking and laughing. And I'm looking around. And I can start my keen sense of hearing. I could hear the ice moving on the other side of the room. So I said, waitress, and I asked her to just take my glass and put some gin in it. <laughs> Nobody would know, right? I thought no one would know. Well, what ended up happening was I went out that night after drinking to oblivion, as our book talks about. After I left that club and I went out and I did some other stuff, I ended out, I started out with a car and a brand new suit, okay? And I ended up with no car and half of my suit. And I ended up coming back to the place where I was living. And this is important for me to let the new person know. The place that I was living was a sober environment. There was four of us living in this house. And all those times that I would raise my hand and say that I'm standing and I got one day, I'd have to go back to this house and these guys would say, dude, you got to get your act together or you got to go. This is a sober place and you're just not doing it. Even though they weren't going to AA, they were staying sober. So they were going to put me out. Well, this last time, July 10th, I came into the house, and this was as degrading as I can feel. Well, there's some other things that were pretty low, too, that I did, but um, there was, there was a, a, a throw rug on the floor, and one of the guys worked at night, and he would sleep on the couch. So what I did was I curled up on that throw rug below him, and, you know, waiting for him to wake up, and I kind of felt like a dog, really. And I was waiting for him to wake up, but when he woke up, I could tell him, Hey, man, I, I drank again, and I knew what was going to happen. So when he woke up, I told him, and the three guys went in the kitchen, and they took it. They had a house meeting on me. I had to sit in the living room, and they came out, and I said, I'm out. Now, once I left here, and I'm, I'm going to go into this. Once I left there, there I knew I wasn't going to have a place to go, you know. So they came out, and one of the guys came up to me, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, to me, he says, you got one shot. You're out of here. I mean, these guys want you out. I beg them not to put you out. After that day, the next day, I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was willing to do whatever you said. Okay? So it was like I had no other option. All of my cards had been played. So now I came in Alcoholics Anonymous amongst people that I now was starting to look at. I didn't pay any attention to you guys the first month or so in and out of here. I mean, you know, you just some people, I never drank with any of you guys. You look different, and, you know, you didn't go to the places I hung out with, you know, or the places I hung out at. So this time when I came in, this time 
I was willing to do whatever you said. So I got a home group. Okay, I joined up and became a member. And I didn't know what that meant. So for the new people, in case you don't know, I reached for my wallet, and I was like, okay, how much is that to join? I was serious. I was ready to buy my membership in the Alcoholics Anonymous. And the guy looked at me, and he says, dude, man, just fill out the card, man. All you got to do is fill out the card, and you're a member. So I filled out the card at Group 3, and I've been a member of Group 3 now for 14 and a half years. And it's been... It's been like, right, you know what, that's for AA, that ain't me, right? Because left to my own devices, I would have drank a long time ago, really. With all of the things that I've had to walk through in these last, in the years that I've been sober, I don't know that I could have done it. If I had a known, brand new, what was down the road for me for 14 years, I would have left. <laughs> don't know about you, I would have been out the door, it's like, dude, I am out, I'm just going to drink, forget that, you know. I'm going to go back to jail. I know the guy's in jail. I'll just hang out there. I don't want to go through that, right? But what has happened is these things have gradually come up in my life, and God, and I believe this now, God will not give you more than you can bear. And as I've stayed sober and have worked the steps and had a good active sponsorship in my life, I've been able to walk through some things in my life that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not had a sponsor and you. What I do for the new person is I come in Alcoholics Anonymous to listen to the people who are in Alcoholics Anonymous, how they do one day at a time. You know, we can sit up here or in a meeting, a regular meeting, and we can quote these nice passages out of the book. Anybody can do that. I'm looking at the guy who's just coming in here crying because he lost his job or the wife was caught with another man or vice versa or whatever the situation is, and they haven't drank, and they're sitting in the meeting. Because, like, when I need to store that up, just like a squirrel, because when that stuff starts to happen to me, at least I know, hey, I can get through this too. Last year in April, I found out that, the, you know, and I'll tell you about this. Last year in April, I found out that my mom has cancer. Now, you know, everyone in my family, cousins, everyone's still kicking and breathing. You know, and my mom is too right now, but it's like, this is the woman who, in May of 1988, when I was getting ready to get some help, I said that I was going to call her and I was going to go back to Fresno. I was going to leave Sacramento, go live with her until I could get into a program that was going to help me to stay dry, right? Straight, sober, whatever words you want to use. And what she said, for you that maybe have relatives that are out there or whatever, I'm going to just tell you my experience. I call my mom. Mom, I need a place to stay. And, and when I get there, I'm going to go to this other place, but I can't get in for like three months. She said to me this, I love you, Stan, but when you come here and you get off the bus, now I've had brand new cars all my life. So when I'm getting off the bus now, when you get off the bus, don't come here. And she said, well, Mom, your son, you know Stan, Stanley, as she calls me, I, uh, don't you dare. <laughs> she said, I stopped praying for you. Uh-oh. I grew up in the church, right? And I'll maybe tell you a little about about that. But when my mom stops praying for me, all of a sudden I'm looking for the lightning bolts to start taking me out because I'm feeling that I'm living under my mom's prayers all this time, and I'm out there. But now she's telling me, not only do I not want you here at my house, but you are out of my hand. You're in God's hand. I'm done. And when she hung the phone up from me, I felt like I was the only person on the planet. There was not another soul on this planet, this earth. I didn't know where I would go. I knew where I had been. I'd been to jail. And I knew that in jail, I got three hots in a cot. I knew that. And sometimes it was pretty cool hanging out in there with the fellas. <laughs> you know? So what I thought was... I'm looking around in this last apartment that I had. There's peanut shells, apple cores, and banana peels all over the floor. 
Because that's what I would eat. I'd take the little dollar that I'd, you know, save up, and I'd go across the street to this fruit stand, and I'd buy something to eat. And I looked around at this place, and it's like, I need a meal, man. Mom's not there. Well, if I run out in the street naked or if I take a brick and throw it through a window, they'll pick me up and take me to jail. Made sense to me. It made sense to me. But then, I don't know about you, one of those what we call moment of clarities kind of came in. It's like, call this guy that I used to, that used to be my employer. So I called my employer, and what he said was, you call around. And you call a couple of these places in the phone book, and I'll tell them you still work here so that you can get in and get some help. Now, I called the place, got in, they introduced me to you. That's how all that happened. How did I get to that point for the new person? I didn't grow up saying, in the sandbox, when I grow up, I want to be an alky and go to jail and hang out and have nothing. You know, that's what I want to be. What do you want to be? You know, that was not what I wanted. I had these dreams and aspirations just like everybody else did. And I don't know if there was a wire cross. Some people talk about wires being crossed. I don't know if that's the case. I know that when I was six years old, I was reciting poetry at Fresno State University. I know, I mean, that's no big deal. It was just my mom made me. And so, you know. Everything I ever wanted to do, or she saw that I had an interest in, like dinosaurs, all of a sudden there'd be a whole set of books on anthropology, you know, study of dinosaurs. Uh, hello? You know, hello? Anyway, so, so, you know, growing up, growing up in school, I was the kid that was always mocked and ridiculed, if you will. You know, um, he thinks he's so smart. Look at him in church. He knows all the scriptures. You know, they call me this little preacher's kid in church. And all I was doing was doing what they were, I was told to do. I just wanted to grow up and be good. I was told that if I read this book and act this way, you're going to grow up and be a good kid and a young, fine man. Well, how come no one likes me at my home? In the church, I go to school, I was mocked that people kidded me all the time and pr played pranks on me, and I just would laugh. I remember in the fifth grade when I got glasses for the first time. I walked into my fifth grade class. Actually, I walked to the door of my fifth grade class, and I opened the door, and I could, like, see this now. And I stood in that door with these glasses on, not these, but the ones I had then. And... Uh, <laughs> And all of a sudden, it seemed like that entire class started laughing at the kid in the door with the glass. And right now, standing here, 47 years old, that still, I still feel that. I wanted to turn around and run. But what I did was what, with what little pride I had as a little, little boy, I stood there, and I kind of raised my head up so that the tears just wouldn't roll down, and I just waited until everybody got through laughing, and I went in and took my seat. So already starting to be implanted in my mind is that I was different. I was different. I was different at home. I was really different at school. Look how they did me. You know, and so when I found alcohol at the age of 16 years old, it was the best thing for me. All of a sudden, for me, when I found alcohol at 16, I felt like I fit in instead of being a square. You know, I was cool, right? I could do things that I never thought that I could do. Stand up to you and say something back, you know, or ask the lady, uh, you want to go something with me, you know, or whatever. I had li what they call that, liquid courage. You know, I had that. And it was a great sensation. I chased that feeling from the time I was 16 till I came into Alcoholics Anonymous at the ripe old age, and it was really old of 33. I still have the driver's license sitting on my fireplace with that picture of what I looked like at the age of 33. I looked 100. <laughs> oh, 
wrinkled up, you know, face was small, eyes were sunk in, and I'm trying to smile. Yeah. <laughs> Still trying to look good. That's what we do. Still trying to look good. Before I found Alcoholics Anonymous, I weighed 100. I got on the scale and starting point, so that's the only way I know. So it's not like I'm making this up. I weighed 144 pounds. Okay, standing here now, I weigh 193. So, you say, he does. You can imagine what he must have looked like at 144 pounds. And I'm walking around in my apartment complex with my tank top on, <laughs> strutting out to the mailbox to get my mail, thinking that I'm looking good. <laughs> We will not let that look good go, whether it is going to the mailbox or, I mean, doing it that way or, you know, got a nice car, nice bikes or whatever. I mean, we won't let the look good go. That look good almost killed me. It really did. So what happened was, you know, I ended up, when I found Alcoholics Anonymous, I just came in here and I took hold of this thing. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to live the life anymore that I had been living. You know, I had hurt people. My daughter, bless her heart, I left when she was three years old, right? And I was the kind of dad, don't know about any of the dads out here, but I was the kind of dad where it's like I'd say, okay, I'm coming to pick you up, and I wouldn't show up. Or when I showed up, I was drunk, and I'd just take her and drop her off at the lady I happened to be dating for the week to watch her so I could go out and continue to party. Or when she was riding in, in my chair, She's in my car. I got a beer between my legs. She's in the back seat with no seatbelt on, and I'm driving around the town drunk. That's how I took care of my daughter. Don't know about you. You know, I didn't come here because I was good. I came here because I was sick. You know, and I did those things because I was sick, not because I didn't care about my daughter. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. So, you know, I wondered... After I found, I, I, well, I'll just tell you this one time. I took her over to this lady that I had been dating, and these are the kinds of things that happened to me when I was out there. I was uh, dating this woman, and I hadn't dated her for a while, and I saw her. She, so I went over to her house. Of course, I was drinking. My daughter was with me in tow. She went in and played with her child. I went to bed with her. I woke up in the morning. This is fast forwarding on all this stuff. I woke up in the morning, and I roll over, and I look up, and there's this dude looking at me. You know, and he's like three times my size, and he's like looking down at this 144 weakling, and he's like, and he asked this profane question, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and me, I'm a sale, I'm in sales, so I always got an answer, right? <laughs> um, dude, I fell asleep, man. You know, I was drinking, and then he threw the covers off, and he says, naked? So he picked me up and he threw, he threw me across the room, all right? And I thought, my, I thought he was going to kill me. But I guess maybe he saw how bad of a shape I was in, stature-wise, and he just said to me, you know, man, put your clothes on, get out of here. If I ever see you again, I'll kill you. That was what he said. So I, I'm scrambling to put my clothes on and get out. I turn around and look, and there's my daughter looking at me in the doorway. You know, and we go, oh, but I know I'm not the only one that did things like that, but that's my story. And this was my child who was entrusted to my care some of the times while I was drinking, and that's how I tried to take care of her. So when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah, I had a lot of, as uh, this old, this fellow used to tell me, you know, I had this, this big ball of stuff behind you. And even though you've gotten sober now, it's not stopping. It's still there. And it'll keep coming at you till you turn around and face it. And what he gave me was, well, visually, he says, now take that teaspoon and go to that big old ball of crap and start taking it apart. And as much as it just disgusted me to do that, that's what I started to do. To this day, my daughter and I are friends. Okay, I can't say, you know, and for the new person, you, you know, maybe some people come in here and they get everything back in their lives. 
You know, some people come in here and they don't. Okay? So cuz I don't have that wonderful relationship with my child like some people maybe have gotten. You know, that's not a reason for me to say, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has not given me what I need. I'm out of here. This thing, they lied to me about this. I thought I was going to get this, that, and that, and it's not happening, so I'm leaving. They never told me that. They said if I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I stayed here and I worked the steps, I'll stay sober. Period. So it's like, oh, so I'm not getting a car? <laughs> you know, or like the, that job that got a six figure, you know, salary, that doesn't come with this? No. You get to breathe. And the guy, and that's, that's exactly how Doc used to say it to me. Doc was a, was a man who was my sponsor. And what he used to say to me was, you breathe in one more time than you breathe out, Stan, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> That's not in the book. Sorry, Stan, that's just what it is. And I would be over at this man's house. Doc is the originator of Hall, in case anybody didn't. He's passed away last year. He's one of those that didn't make it this year. But, uh, you know, he, old-time Alcoholics Anonymous, is how he got it. And that's how he gave it to me. You know, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate what he passed on to me and the way he did it. You know, I would go over to his house early in the morning as a newcomer, and he would sit in his chair, and he was a diabetic, and he'd say, Stan, do you see this needle with this insulin in it? Yeah, I see it. You know, and he'd stick himself in the leg, and he'd give himself a shot. He says, I have to do this to stay sober, I mean, to stay alive, and that's how you need to do Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm like, so, I mean, I was into, like, what do you call it, whatever that, I mean, I understood what he was telling me. And it's like, okay, so I have to do this thing one day at a time, not a year at a time, you know. And what I have done in Alcoholics Anonymous has not been the perfect little AA. Are men muffins? Because <laughs> I have not been the most perfect one, okay. I have done some things in Alcoholics Anonymous that I am appalled at myself for doing. Five years sober, it's when Sterling and I hooked up, all right? So we hooked up, I was five. I was pissed at the world. You know, I'm walking around in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, at this one place. I, my home group was group three, and then I also went to traditional because another man was my, that became my sponsor's name was Woody Woodard, and he passed on too a few years ago. But he said, you know, I told him I hated traditional. You know, wasn't any black people there? I don't want to go there. You know, and that was the way I looked at it. He said, well, Stan, I want you to come three times a week. <laughs> I'd go over to traditional, and of course, you know, and you knew you just doing all like this. I want people to come up to me. <laughs> and they're walking all around me. So, you know, I had to eventually learn how to stick my hand out. Traditional is like a second home to me now. At five years sober, though, you know, I was, I was really, really a pissed off drunk in Alcoholics Anonymous for whatever reason, probably just because. And, 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 and I was walking around with this big log on my shoulder, and I remember that I was chairing this meeting at Traditional, and the way I got my current sponsor was he was sitting in that time you could smoke in the place, and he was sitting in a non-smoker, and he was just cracking up, just laughing himself to death. And I thought the guy was new, you know, because only new people laugh like that, you know. So what I ended up doing was after the meeting, I'd go up to him. i said, hey, man, nice to meet you. Here's my phone number if you ever want to talk, right? And he just said, okay, hey, thanks, okay, I'll talk to you, thanks a lot. And he went on his merry way. He never said, dude, I got way more time than you. He didn't say a word. He just said, thank you, no problem. I ran into the guy at a dance, and, and, and my was falling off. And so, you know, I, I, we started talking. And I asked him, I said, how much time you got, man? And he told me. You know, I had five, and he had like 13. And so we, uh, we hooked up, and he helped me. And when he left Sacramento in 97, uh, 
there's been a, you know, there are some things that have changed. Deborah and I were just talking. She was just mentioning, man, you a lot of people know you. Because, you know, it's, 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 wherever I seem to go, there's somebody that I know. And I make myself feel pretty comfortable in alcohol. It's anonymous now. Whether it's up in the hills, places I would not even want to go. <laughs> against y'all okay but wherever I seem to go I am okay that's all right I am I am okay and he has shown me that and he said to me we talked I don't know when a year or two ago he said isn't that kind of funny now there's people that seem to know you from San Francisco to wherever it's not because of this it's because wherever I go I say hi my name is Stan you know What's your name? Hi, hi, hi. You know, and I've learned how to do that. For me, don't know about you, and you will hear people talk about this. The safest place for me in Alcoholics Anonymous is right in the middle. If I'm standing out on the outside of this deal, and I decide, gin and tonic sounds pretty good today. And I turn around to leave, there's nobody there. But if I'm in the middle, i got to go through a whole bunch of people to get out. Somebody is going to say something to me like, hey, Stan, can you give me a ride? Or Stan, can I get your phone number? Or Stan, you got a minute to talk. Uh, you know. And I know, for me, I can't say no in Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe you can. Maybe you say, oh, man, i got too much. No. Okay, I can't. And that's just my deal. So um, what I come to know for me is that the safest place of this deal is right down, right plumb in the middle of it, staying active, being a part of this thing. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I remember hearing someone, and I know Ross is involved, I heard someone say, now this is what the mind heard. This may not be what they said, but what this thing heard was that the people involved in hospitals and institutions Stay sober. Now, they may have just said, you know, something else. But I heard that. So I got involved in hospitals and institutions. And I did it out of desperation. Everything I've done in Alcoholics Anonymous for the new people is out of desperation. I don't want to drink. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to say, look up, put your hands behind, click, click. I don't want to go through that anymore. But officer... You know, going. I, I don't want to have to deal with that. So if I get myself active in this deal, be it picking up ashtrays, be it being a greeter, doing this, secretary in a meeting, whatever, and when one thing ends, I pick up something else. And what I've come to find out in the time that I've been sober, that the people, is the same people are doing all the work. You know, did you not notice for the newer people, that the higher amounts of sobriety, it was only like one, two, but then you get down there to the one years and the twos or whatever, there's a few. Where'd they go? And you can't tell me they all just can't get out at night or they all are dead, because that's not, I don't buy that, okay? Where did they go? See, I thought it would be, shouldn't it be the other way around? But it never is. Now, like what I know Phil says, I mean, I got to come in here to take care of me. I can't worry about you. And I I understand that you guys are really strong on the traditions and and things. And it's like the most important thing is the group followed closely by me. So I have got to be here. In order to experience this thing, I've got to be a part of this thing. You know, one thing that I'll say about the traditions, and then I'll, I'll... I just, my voice and stuff, I'm not going to probably talk too long. But, um, you know, Tradition 3, my favorite, which says that the only desire for membership is a, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. It doesn't say anything else. Okay? The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So, a person comes into Alcoholics Anonymous and they're a cross dresser. Am I going to treat that person different? 
Yeah, we do. You know, that's sad because here's a person that's coming in because they have nowhere to go, just like you. And they come in. Now, that's just one. There's all these other people that maybe come in. And do we treat people the same? No. Am I the AA police? No. I know what I have to do. And if you've been sober and you have good sponsorship, you know what you've got to do. You still go up to that person and you make them feel just as welcome. You know, but what I know I see is people just kind of like walk all around and not say things. You know, we do that because we are just so full of us. Alcoholics, the most self-centered creatures God has made. God didn't even want the gratitude balloons. <laughs> They're stuck in the tree. <laughs> I couldn't believe that, man. I'm looking at <laughs> the tree's blue. All the red balloons are gone. All the blue ones are in the tree. <laughs> You know, this is the best deal going. Why in the world would I want to, you know, cash in on this and take a chance? Because this thing, which has been with me all those years, is always out to tell me, I got a better idea. I got a better idea. You don't have to go to those meetings anymore. Just buy speaker tapes. They say the same thing at the meetings. You don't need to be there. <laughs> Happens, right? Happens. Then a person either comes back with one day or they come back nuts after being gone for a year, two, or five. You know? So the easier, softer way, but this thing just doesn't seem to want to get that. The easier, softer way is to stay active here. And it seems to me that this group is a very active group. It's grown from the two, three, and four people <laughs> to whatever right now. You know, now maybe some of you all came from other places, you know, but obviously that group's doing okay. You know, so happy, I'm, I mean, it's a happy anniversary. It's a good celebration. It's the first of the year. You know, um, my uh, relationship with my mom today is good. What I can tell you is that at 14 years sober, uh, actually before I turned 14 and I found out about this, I was the most angriest member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought. Now, of course, there's probably someone more angrier, you know, but uh, I was pissed off at God. How could you do this to my mom? She's never smoked. She's never drank. She's only been a good Samaritan. She's raised a family on her own. This, I was angry. I was, and, and, and then I'm sitting at a meeting talking about how angry I was until one gentleman came up to me and he says, Stan, at least you're sober for your mom. When I found out about mine, it was through the obits when I was still out on the streets. So it brought me right back to, oh, yeah, I am sober. I am able to be there for her. Right? It didn't change the fact of me being mad and angry. And what happened is that just kept growing. And, you know, I have this, I have this car. It's a luxury car. I guess they call them that. But, you know, it's, it's this car. And what I ended up doing was um, I went out and I bought some hardcore rap music. I don't listen to hardcore rap, but I wanted it. And, I, and I'm riding around town in my infinity, listening to the bullets going off in the speakers, and them saying all of this stuff, and I'm just getting really worked up, you know, and this guy pulls up next to me in Fresno. I was in Fresno visiting my mom, and, uh, and he's like, says, dude, you ought to, and I jumped out the car, man, I was ready to fight. And then it's like, you're a member of AA, dude, for a while, what are you doing? Who is this guy? You know, I'm, I'm like, I had to catch myself in the things that I was starting to want to do. I was wanting to get shot. That's what would have happened. Okay? And let me tell you why I know that that was what would have happened. A week ago, 
a week ago, the attitude that I had that I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm angry at everyone and I'm just going to confront people happened to me. It was God's little way of playing me. Me, man. You know, because what he did, I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm driving in the parking lot of a grocery store. I pull in. Didn't think I did anything. I parked my car. The car came up behind me. Dude jumped out, had his hat turned sideways, and he starts to confront me, and he was ready to shoot me. And I just said, the thing that I've learned to say in Alcoholics Anonymous, as opposed to getting into some big, long confrontation or whatever, I said, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. And the dude backed up, got back in his car, and he left. I went in the store, and it's like, that was a lesson. And immediately, it's like, I started to say, as you people can drive on by, I don't care anymore, you know. <laughs> that was God's way of getting my attention, see. So I don't know how God works in your life. You know, I can tell you he's real active because I'm a real active person with this active mind up here going on. So, you know, that's just one little lesson that God has shown me since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, other than that, there really isn't anything else for me to tell you tonight other than just the fact that I'm just glad to be a part of this deal. And if you're starting out on it, you know, this is the best thing going. You know, I don't know what's down the road for you, you know, perils or triumphs or any of that stuff. All I know is if we, we stay in here, we can get through whatever comes up, right? Now, I still haven't had to deal with death yet, you know, and I keep saying, well, heck, I mean, she's still getting up, fixing her own food, doing her own thing, you know, she's just really frail now, but... I might go before her. So why do I want to live in a state of depression? Be happy. Celebrate life. So my charge to you is celebrate life. You know, this was a gift that we have been charged with, a responsibility. And we wonder why. Why not? You know, you have... The, we have the ability to reach a drunk when no one else can. So since we can do that, shouldn't we be doing that regardless of what they look like, smell like, or wear? That's what we're here for. So it's not about standing up here trying to impress you because I can't impress you. I am not trying to impress you. This thing wants me to think that if you don't say certain things, they won't like you. I know that's different. You're just as sick as I am. <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> you know, we're going to go out of here. We're going to go home. We're going to stay sober tonight. And we're going to go our separate ways tomorrow. And somewhere we're going to converge and have another meeting somewhere. You know, so for the committee that asked me, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.